Hi guys, welcome to the Hope Be Six podcast. It's me, your host, Aaron, and today I am joined by two absolute superstars. I've got Gemma Perfield and Freya Gregory. How are you doing, girls? All right? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, good, all good, thank you. Amazing, good. Lovely to see you both and thanks for coming on. Um, I feel very humble today to have you both on screen, to be fair. Um, it's never easy getting pros on board and people to talk about this sort of stuff quite openly, so really appreciate having you on. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, so very quickly and nice and easy, let's get some introductions done. Um, Jem, if you want to start us off, a little bit about yourself, where you're playing, where you've played, where you are today, etc. Yeah, so Jem and Perfield, I started at Hull Centre of Excellence as a kid. Um, that was just after playing for Cottingham Rangers boys team and girls team. Um, boys team first, as there wasn't a girls team at first, which is quite interesting now because there's plenty of girls teams around. Uh, from there, I moved to York Centre of Excellence, where I met yourself, Aaron, which was back in the day when I was probably about 12. <laughs> you were. And, uh, so I've grown up a little bit, I like to think. And then uh, from there, went to for Doncaster Bells, my first kind of pro club in the WSL. Then moved overseas to America for four years, where I was at South Alabama and Arizona State University. Came back and signed for Liverpool. And from there... Went to Bristol and I'm now currently at my second year in Leicester. Amazing. Lovely. Thanks, Jen. Cheers, Jen. Freya? Cool. Give us a little, Freya, bit like Freya. little bit younger than Jem, so my my, my timeline's <laughs> a bit shorter, but um started at um a local girls team when I was about nine, ten, I think. Uh did four years at Aston Villa RTC and then made the switch to Birmingham for two as a Villa fan. It's what was right at the time, but uh, come back to Villa two years ago now. So this is my third year at Villa, I think it is. Um, and I spent six months on at Leicester last season. So that's oh how yeah, so that's so that's how you two <laughs> met, right? At Leicester. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and good season as well last year for both of you. Really, really good season. It was lovely. Actually, I said to Jem actually last year that I, I expected big things from you, Freya, last year at Leicester, and it was good to see. So uh, yeah, good. Okay, cool. So let's dive straight in. Um, Mental health, when you hear that term, what does it what does it mean to you uh, and how does that kind of fit in your day to day life, your day to day regime as a ladies professional? Either of you start ahead, Jem. Um, I think mental health to me obviously means like being happy and healthy, but mentally as well as physically. And I think as a footballer, that's a, a really big thing. I think no footballer can probably say they've been through the career without any setback or any form of you know, disappointment. And I think that's how you handle that and how you deal with that is big. Um, obviously, the women's game's growing, so I think the pressures are increasing. Therefore, fan participation's bigger and media, social media's got a hold of the game. So you might get comments now and again that might not be the nicest, but yeah. I think figuring out how to filter that, how to deal with the pressures and how to deal with the highs and lows of football, because it's a lot of uncertainty at times and your career kind of is in the hands of someone else a lot of the time um so i think it's important that you have strategies to deal with that uh and have a good support system around to help as well yeah lovely cheers Jim. yeah i appreciate that and, and it's i think for me it's like i don't know whether you agree freya but it, it's something that do, do, do you think the ladies tend to talk about that concept a bit more in a football world or, or is it still really kind of uh, carries a lot of stigma still? Do, do you know? Do a lot of do a lot of female players come out and talk about it quite openly, or is it all still quite a bit taboo? I, I think for me, to be fair, I've had, I've had this wrote down. Like, obviously, we can only speak for the women's game and what's inside the women's game. We don't see the men's side. But for me, the bond that you build with a team is so strong because you, if you think about, it, you spend more time with that team than you do with a lot with your family a lot of the time. So I feel like for me, somebody's mental health is their well-being as a as a person also as a player because I think it's very easy to just look at it as that's that they're a player they're a football player and this is their life but realistically we all have like we're all people so I think the players just being a player is such a small part of the game that I think someone's well-being like and how their mental health is outside of the game can massively impact negatively or positively them as a player and the opposite way around as well so I think yeah. it's important that 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 is seen as not just sort of what how you're feeling at football, how you're feeling when you're at football. It's it's so much bigger than that, and like your life outside yeah. football. Yeah, definitely, I agree, and and I think that's the that's kind of where we can go with this. Really, is that 
a lot of what happens, I guess, in your personal lives, like Jem said then about social media, touching on upon that kind of um, views and opinions, that criticism perhaps that might come from time to time, um, that not abuse, but let's call it abuse because I think we we have to be real here. You know, there is quite an abusive, toxic environment on social media when players have a bad game or miss a blatant open goal or they miss kick a sh- you know, etc. And people can really get on your backs. And I guess that that can really affect your mental well being, right? So, so as a team, do you deal with that collectively, or do you have um, people within that kind of club? the maybe a, um, a psychologist or someone to go and see and talk to about those sorts of things? I mean, I think uh, the club would obviously report anything they thought was like untoward if it was if it was on social media and they would deal with that in, in a way that they thought was, you know, right. Um, I think it's hard because you're never going to pick up every comment and some people, no. might, some people might not. I mean, I personally just don't look. I'm not that bothered. Um, but I know some players who will sit and scroll and look through every comment and every, and some of them they'll find really insane and funny and others they might might upset them. But I just think it's on personal preference and it's how you deal with stuff. Uh, if you can take it and you think, yeah, it's entertaining enough and you want to look for it, go for it. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, I've actually, what I know, Touchwood never really received anything, but maybe that's because I don't look. Um, <laughs> but I guess people do get tagged in stuff and if you do you might see it And so I just yeah. think it's how much you expose yourself to it and how much then you let it affect you and if you do see it how do you respond um, I know there's players now that are starting to reply back to these just to make people feel stupid and to make awareness of it or there's people that just report it and ignore it so I think whatever you're comfortable with and whatever your kind of mental health can deal with best is the way yeah. you should forward yeah yeah right yeah do you agree yeah no I agree I think I think Jen probably knows me quite well by now but I think it's again like she said all of like personal preference I think like like I said like last year at Leicester if I had a bad game I probably would gravitate more to speaking to someone like Jen or or someone else in the team rather than maybe going through the club's way but again it's personal preference I think if you've got the relationships around you and the support network sometimes being surrounded by those people who might have experienced similar things can be sort of a different be different than speaking quite formally maybe to a member of staff for example or something because they they know they know what it feels like and I think again like Jem said it's just personal preference of how you want to deal with it obviously there's some some situations that would need, would need to be reported reported to the club but no I think it's just whatever you feel most comfortable with really yeah yeah, yeah. I think I think for as a as a younger gun I mean I always refer to Jem as being a young gun because I've known Jem since she was you know tiny tiny but you are much younger than Jem in that sense. So even as a professional now, living in that young people's world where social media is such a massive presence, I mean, for Jem, just kind of coming out of that now, you know, coming into my realm of grey hair and 33-year-oldness, do you know what I mean? So for you, you're very much in that young person zone still. So is social media a massive thing that players have to deal with? Yes, they might be personal preference in terms to dealing with it, but it is something that you're dealing with, right? It is, is a massive thing. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, like, because more young players are coming into the first team game earlier than maybe previously, I've I probably spent the ages of where sort of everyone was, you know, partying or or doing TikToks or social media, whatever. I've been in a first team environment now since probably age of 15, 16. So I feel like I've had to grow up quite quickly and also be yeah. exposed to those things quite early on. Um, but yeah, just it is... It's such a massive part of life, social media. It's in every aspect of life, like not just sport. It's, it, it's re- our world now revolves around social media. Everything's media based. Everything's whatever. So I feel like it's just something that you know, like some media training might help with and things like that. But yeah, it's just something that's so obviously there. It's hard to ignore. So yeah, like Gem yeah, said, yeah. obviously you can choose not to look at things, but at the end of the day, it's just there. It's just there, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think Gem? There's a um, let me careful how I word this, but. With with the men's game, and I'm not asking you both to relate to it, but with the men's game, you know, it, it's so internationally followed and viewed that you are you are um, open to criticism from anyone and everyone, pretty much day day to day. Whereas the females' game is less internationally viewed. It's still internationally viewed, but there's less of a impetus to make sure that people are feeling terrible about how they performed. There's, there's, a, there's a nicer, softer fan base around the females game. Do you know where I'm coming from? So does that have an impact, do you think, on 
on that kind of online trolling, that online criticism, because actually, you know, as a fan of the female game, the last thing I want to do is a, is abuse anybody who's had a bad game for the females. And I wouldn't do that for the men's anyway, but do you know what I mean? So do you reckon that's uh, is that something? Do you reckon? Yeah, I do actually, because I think yeah. that women's football is a lot more of a family friendly environment. I think you can That's tell where I'm coming from. Yeah. From the crowd, you can tell that like it's kids that come and they want to be inspired to be the next yeah. or the next me. And that's that's the exciting thing about women's football. I think it's in a really nice place. I think it's obviously trying to keep it there, but while growing the game, we want everyone to support us. We want you know, groups that follow us around, but we don't want it to become, you know, football hooligans that follow the men around and it becomes quite aggressive. So I think it's getting that balance. Um, but yeah, I really do think that the women's game has a friendlier environment and the comments are few and far between. It is not like the men's game where they're on, you know, they're in the spotlight on the international stage and they can get hit and death threats and all sorts, which obviously is completely uncalled for and unnecessary. Um I don't think the women's game's at that point and hopefully it never gets to that point. Um, it's it's petty things like if Sky Sports or a men's account was to tweet something about a women's account, it's the classic, no one cares. Get yeah. back. But to me, they're quite entertaining. I mean, it's quite funny because I sit there and I think, oh, we get paid to play football. What do you do? Yeah, like, no, totally. Yeah. You can tell me whatever you want, but at the end of the day, I'm probably living out your dream and you're not. So Love you that. can't pay a lot more than that. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. And I think I think I was perfectly said. So for me, it's the I would say, having looked on social media in terms of the impact that social media has on female players and their mental well-being. It's actually the comments from the men's game that I see more of. It's less female followers or family followers, you know, that are giving all of that horrible, horrible comments and horrible abuse. It's It's more so men having a problem in their, you know, sexist, genderist worlds, wherever they want to be putting those comments onto the female game. So for me, it's it, it's not about the female game and what's within it. It's what's coming in from the outside. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I don't think many of the, you know, diehard women's football fans are the issue. I think they're there just to help promote the game and they're actually yeah. really lovely. Like they'll probably message people like me and Freya and other players just to say that they enjoy watching football and they'd love to meet us after a game. There's never really any any hit within the women's fans, which is really nice. Yeah, yeah, totally. So is there, Freya, um, a good support network within the female game? Like, is there is there guidance provided by the club, provisions in place to kind of help you as a player go through any of those tough challenges? Or do you seek private help through a therapist or a counsellor if you felt that's what you needed? As a younger person in the, in, in the world of football now where we have much more within a club than we did, you know, 20, 30 years ago. You know, there was nobody. It was a manager and your assistant. And that was pretty much it. So, you know, we're full of experienced, quality, professional staff now who can help with that sort of thing. So is, is that available to you at a club? Is it available at Villa? Is it available at Leicester? Yeah, I think, to be honest, like that's that's probably one of the massive positives about being in, 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 a, in a team environment is that you get probably different support networks, networks from different areas. You've got obviously... Yeah. Outside of the club, you've got family and friends or whatever, and then you've got the people, the professionals inside the club, like the the safeguarding officers or or the manager or the assistant or the physio you might have a good relationship with, and then you've also got the players. So I think that's such a positive about being in such a good team environment is that you've got support network all around you at all times, really, and all with sort of different, not viewpoints, but different perspectives so they can get sort of, you know, like I might go and speak to my dad who's got quite a level head who can give me an outside perspective or maybe a, a game I played in or whatever. But then if I need to speak to somebody at the club, like a psychologist who about like, I don't know, the mental side of the game or I'm struggling with this, or struggling with that. Like, I think it's just great because there's so many different outlooks and perspectives. So it's not you don't just get one one view on it. Like you because sometimes I know myself, Gem on Earth, sometimes I can look at things very, very quickly and react to things very quickly. So sometimes getting the 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 chat from a player or the chat from a psychologist can really sort of help you see in a different light. So yeah. I feel like that's probably the, one of the biggest things I think being in a team environment is you've got so much support around you all the time yeah yeah so yeah, it's, it's, agree Jan is it the same at Leicester yeah yeah 100% I just yeah. think that the women's games developed both Leicester and Villa are very lucky to have great facilities have a good relationship with the men's side and to be provided everything they kind of need to succeed yeah. um, I think every club is there at this point um, I think there's work to be done probably across the women's game still I don't think everyone will probably be as fortunate as 
myself and Freya right now, but um, hopefully that that will happen and there will be that support for everyone that needs it at some point in the future in the women's fo- uh, football game. Yeah, just just for just for on that note, Jem, about being over in the states, was it was it different over there in regards to mental health than it is here in the game? You know, I feel like when. I was there wasn't something that was really talked about much but I don't know if that's because it was kind of a taboo subject or it yeah. didn't get brought up or if it yeah. was we did seem to have a very happy friendly team that lived in a place where it rained about 30 days a year so it was constant sunshine um yeah. and we won a lot of matches and it was just good fun so maybe it was just because everyone was quite happy you don't know I'm sure there was things going on behind the scenes for some people and if they needed the help, I'm sure they could have got it, you know, the facilities and stuff in America and the, the money they invest into making sure that you're treated as a professional yeah. while you through that course so you're ready to go into professional, you know, sport afterwards is is massive. So I presume there was probably help there, um, but I aren't 100% if anyone utilised it and it wasn't something that everyone really spoke about. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Isn't it? and, and I asked the question because I do find it interesting because here there is a lot of evidence emphasis on well-being and, and mental health of players and and keeping mental health good but you know when I when I flick over to socials and I see some of the American football and I, I, you just don't see it I just I just don't see it you, you know you might see the occasional Samaritans post that comes up now and again but it's just not it's just not there and I I don't know whether that's because what you're saying is that you know brings are pretty okay over there everyone's playing in sunshine everybody's got such positive vitamin d overloads and everybody's okay and there's a lot to be said about that kind of playing environment playing in the sunshine all the time not having to deal with bad weather and climate and all that rubbish you know sometimes that does help and, and maybe that is the reason but i'm get i'm guessing there is support over there like you say the infrastructure and the money in football over there is is immense so i'm guessing it would be there um freya just a question have you ever been have you ever been in a team that's been relegated before uh no come close twice but no. So cool, cool. So no. Gem, you have. How does how does that impact a player's mental health when you work your asses off all season and it's just not quite enough and, and, and the team goes down? How does that affect kind of that? And how and for you, Frey, how did it affect you nearly being relegated, you know, nearly in that position? I mean, I think that it's obviously tough and I think people forget like it is your livelihood. So at times I've got friends outside of football, which I love them to pieces because they're my friends outside of football for a reason. They have no idea about football. But if it was mentioned, they'd be like, oh, well, it'll be all right. And I'm like, no, I don't think you understand. Like yeah. That's like me saying you're going to get demoted from your job and you're going to go from being a manager to now being, I don't know, an assistant. Well, it's not, it's not all right, really. <laughs> I work yeah. every day as hard as kind of everyone else and it's the last thing you want. Uh, it definitely takes its toll. I, I'll be honest. When when in that season there was a lot of tears, there was a lot of, is this ever going to end? Can we do it? Can we not? At some days we were like, well, we can stay up, we can do this. And other days we we're like, well, we're down and out here. Like there's absolutely no way that we can do this. Yeah. And it is just a roller coaster. And trying to stay level headed and positive through that is very very tough. But like Freya said, I think it's where the team comes in massively. You're in it together at the end of the day and you're all working to the same common goal. So if you can have that close, tight-knit team that can still try and make training fun and yeah. make it exciting to turn up and make it a nice environment to be in, regardless of the situation, it does make it a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, what well, like that was probably the hardest season of my life at Bristol because, especially towards the end, I think it was one point, the last day could have dictated the whole season. I watched it. I watched it and I, I thought, oh, oh God. Escape. So yeah. it it was very tough. So what do you do? What do you do, Freya, to kind of, yes, you've got your team, you've got your, you've got your players around you, but h- how do you keep positive when, when you find yourself on a slippery slope, individually or as a team? Do you know, like, what, wh- yeah. where do you go? What, what, what do you do? What are your tips? Well, I think, to be honest, for me, like, because, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my first <clears throat> season was at Villa was when Marcus Bignot and Jamie Davies were there. And like, I think, Jen, we might talk about the same season because that was when, yeah. And it came down to the last game and we needed a draw against Arsenal. 
And no, yeah, no team above the top four had got a point out of us that whole season. And we played, I think we played <laughs> no attackers on the pitch. I remember Manu Ibuchi, our best player of that season, didn't even step on the pitch. Like It was just a line of sort of nine players at the back. <laughs> we had no, no attacking football. It was just, <laughs> we stood there for about 90 minutes in a line of nine. Um, <clears throat> and like Jem said, like, we just, we narrowly escaped it on that last day. But no, I think for me, like, it's important, I think, to an extent where you do let yourself come away from football sometimes because our job's so intense and we're there five, six, seven days a week, whatever it might be. It's so, And we're there for an intense period of time and whatever we do is working towards a game every week. It can be quite over, like information overload sometimes, I feel like. So I think it's just important like, on my days off, like I'll make sure I always go to brunch with my mum or, or go and see my friends outside of football and just talk about something that's not football related. Yeah, it's almost yeah. like when, when COVID happened, you, you feel like wherever you go, you're just speaking about COVID or... Like it becomes a bit like like when I come home, bless them, my mum and dad, or I come home from an England camp, they'll be asking me questions. And the nice way possible, I just don't want to answer them. Like I just don't want to come back and then have to have to speak about yeah. football again. So I think for me it's just important that you need to like sort of let yourself go from that sometimes. Um and when you get the time off, do something completely different with with friends yeah. outside of football or with or with players or whatever. Um yeah, yeah. yeah, I just think it's finding the balance of, you know, keeping focused on on your job, obviously, but just letting yourself go a little bit sometimes and yeah. just seeing the other side of your life, really. I love that. I love that prayer. And I think I think that's kind of one of the messages that I've banged home the last 15 years is that you can have a passion or you can have a, a something that you really love to do, whether it's your professional career, whether it's your a hobby and interest. But there's got to be other things that come into your life because you cannot put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, because when those eggs start cracking and it's all the same thing, where do you go? Like, what, what what are your outlets? Where's your escape? You know, family and friends is obviously a really important one. And I think for many of us, we can neglect our family and friends. We can neglect those social circles because they're just they're not offering you that buzz and that drive and that fuel that you get from that one thing, which for you two is, 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 is professional football. And, you know, it is really important. So for me, for example, you know, I've always been into the gym, but over the last kind of three or four years, I've really realised that that isn't my be all and end all. You know, I have two beautiful children. I have a life. I, I like to pick up a guitar, I, you know, like those other things that give me that satisfaction. I have tried to work on more to make sure that they they take a place in my life where it's not just about the gym, the gym getting massive. You know, that's not it's not all my life is about now, whereas 10 years ago it very much was. So I totally love that. Jamie, you know, what, what things do you do outside of football? And I know you're a massive family person, Jem. I know, I know you are. So other things other than your family, like where where are you going for that kind of buzz that isn't football? To be honest, I probably, I'm similar to Freya in terms of I would always go meet friends for coffee, go out for brunch. I like a walk, especially if it's not raining. Uh, I like to just go out and go somewhere peaceful. So it's kind of the opposite. I probably don't kind of crave the buzz. I probably actually go the other way and think, how can I relax and completely switch off? Yeah. I, I know that when I'm back in football, I'm ready to try and achieve that buzz again and I'm ready to be on it and be really switched on. So, yeah, it's completely kind of switching off for me. Like, I do yoga daily, which I quite enjoy. Uh, I use the Headspace app and do the mindfulness nice. daily, which, again, I enjoy. It just gives me a chance to reflect on my day and what I want to do and what I want to achieve that day and, and kind of just take myself out of, you're a footballer and all you're going to do is play football and I think that's really important is like we've all said remembering that we're people as well as footballers yeah, and for me they're just two little switch offs that I like to use and then like you said obviously a massive family person if I get a day off I'm straight back here uh, yeah. to family and, and my boyfriend and my friends and it's yeah. really nice to have that outside of football and have that support system away from football. That's lush. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, and I think all those things that you just spoke about there about kind of not finding something else to buzz you, but just finding a place where actually nothing's going on and and, it, and there's nothing to have to worry about or cling yourself to and being quite mindful and kind of showing some gratitude for life, I guess, the simple things. So I like in the, every morning I write down three things in a journal that I'm grateful for. You know, I've done it for years. I've, I keep doing it and, you know, doesn't actually mean anything to anybody else. But to me, it's just that that five minutes in the morning before the hecticness starts where I just sit and chill and grab a coffee and just think about the things that I'm grateful for. And I guess that's, that's kind of that realm, isn't it? So that's really lovely. Um, Freya, we've got Villa, we've got the foundation, Tyro Mings, 
all very open about talking about mental health, particularly Tyrone. Is there a Tyrone Ming presence in the females, in the lady side, do you think, that is 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 very um, open about their mental health? Um, I think, obviously, for me, it's a little bit different <clears throat> because I've spent a lot of time away from the team. But coming back in, there's very sort of, there's big characters. There's, we all, everyone seems to be kind of doing their part in making sure that we create an environment where it's supportive, it's understanding. Um, players that, to be fair, I've only met uh, not many times now because I've only been in a few days. But like Rachel Corsi, she's, I can already tell she's a massive sort of, almost like leader in the change room in that she sets the standards, but she also is very approachable, ch checks up on people. Like she sent me a text of a week asking how my first week was, whatever. Um, but no, I just think, to be honest, in general at the moment, like it's just about everyone sort of doing their part in creating an environment where we feel supported um, by each other more than anything. Um, but yeah, Rachel Corsi and, and other players like that, I think, do their part. Um, but yeah, I think it's more about, again, like a team effort. I think everyone sort of does their bit for everyone. So Yeah, it's yeah. good. I, I know I know that, um, you know, those those older heads, I shan't put you in that bracket yet, Jen, but you're not far. Those older heads kind of do... They do do that role, don't they? Do you know what I mean? I think they do in any any realm of life. Those older, older heads, those wiser kind of people do want to look out for the younger lot. And I guess with you, Freya, being in that younger, younger female bracket, that's really important for you. Is, is it important to have those role models in the team to help you settle and to help you kind of get through day to day? Yeah, definitely. And I think for me, also something that I go by is that, yes, I'm young and I've only had, say, three or four years experience in, in playing professional football. But equally, I think age, no, sorry, maturity comes not with age, but with experiences. So I feel like, for yeah. example, in my 19 years of life, I might experience something that somebody who's 55 might, might, might never experience and uh, vice versa. So I think we can all contribute in different ways, no matter if we're young or old. But no, definitely, I think having older players like Corsi and, and people like Remy Allen or, or Tash Harden, I was joined, is like, it's just so it's good because you get different experiences that they've had that which can probably um be similar to what you might experience it now so i feel yeah, like yeah, yeah. but yeah definitely it's important that we both sort of bounce off each other and and everyone brings sort of something different to each other so yeah yeah Jem, do you have do you have someone like that at leicester do you have a few heads that kind of stand out from the crowd and, and lead the way in regards to well-being and checking up on everybody and stuff yeah, no, I think similar to Freya, we've actually got quite a nice team environment. I'd say there's quite a few of us that would take on that role of checking on people. And uh, there's a group, I guess it depends kind of who's in your group and who you would maybe check to uh, more than others. But I mean, someone that springs to mind straight away is Ash Plunter. She is literally not an older head, actually. I think she's actually a year younger than me, so she must be about 24. But just a lovely person, a true professional. A great person to have around, uh, very caring, and just kind of takes on that mum role. I yeah. think because yeah. she's such a lovely person, she wants to make sure that everyone's all right, and she will drop you a message on an off day. And I think there's a few of us that would, but I, Ash is definitely the person who comes to mind in that. Yeah, love that, love that. You see, she does quite a lot on social media as well. I follow Ash, and she's she's well involved in it and a lot of things, isn't she? Um, yeah, lovely girl. She seems, I mean, to be fair, I, I can't say a bad word about any female professional that I follow, actually, to be fair. Every, you all seem such lovely people. And I think that's a lovely reflection on the female game because that isn't always the image or the vision you get from the men's side. So um, it's nice. It's nice to see that. There's certainly that that focus and touch on 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 being a human being, I think. is that, And that's really, really important. And I think that's probably why you get the family crowds and you get, you know, you get what we were talking about earlier, that real kind of family ethos environment that want to support and watch the games and actually it's not about who wins or or how well you play it's just about supporting the game and supporting the kind of culture and and trying to get it back and trying to get it to the platform that it belongs and and you know deserves to be on really so yeah good okay um I was going to ask about kind of personal experiences but I think we've gone through that I don't think we need to dwell again on that kind of you've both spoken about things that's happened or, or people that you've known, et cetera, that have gone through those and what you kind of do to get through it. So um, let's switch it away from mental health kind of to, to close up a little bit. So we've got the ladies in the Euros at the minute smashing it uh, into the semis against Sweden on Tuesday. Uh, players to watch. Who's going to shine on Tuesday night? You know, who's who's going to come to the forefront and, and, and do the business on, on through Tuesday? Uh, for me, I think, to be honest, I think one player like I'd, I don't know, anybody who knows me well enough will know I think Lauren Hemp's just a bit of a joke. <laughs> I think she's just such a good player. Like, 
especially at how young she is, but also people who do the probably the work that goes unnoticed. Like I think um, Kira Walsh was unreal against uh, Spain, um, but no, Lauren Ham probably for me definitely. I think she's a, such a flary player, and I think who she play? Who she play for? City? Is it City? Yeah. 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 She's quality. She's quality. Gem. So you know I'm gonna say I think Georgia Stanway plays. Took it out of my mouth, mate. You read my mind. I was gonna say Georgia. She is. I mean, she's a great player anyway for Man City, but for England, she just seems to step it up another notch. I think a confidence of getting in pockets, turning, running at people, turning defence to attack quickly. I think she's fantastic, and I think she's had a great tournament so far. And I think that goal the other night to win the game just kind of proved it that she will chuck the team on her shoulders and think dig in when it gets tough. Um, and then the other shout I'm going to give is Alessia Russo. I think she'll come off the bench and she'll make an impact. And I think she's done that all tournament. And I think that's been a big part of England's success. It's not just the 11. They've got such a strong squad. Um, so like people like her and Ella Toon that are coming off the bench, making things happen and uh, creating opportunities, I think it's going to be massive. Yeah, Tuna Russo have been absolutely class, to be fair. And I don't I don't know how much longer they can both find themselves sat on the bench. You know what I mean? There come, there'll come a point where both need to start starting and have whatever capacity that is. I don't, I'm not sure. Probably not this tournament, but it won't be long at all, you know. Um, Kirby's been class as well. Um, she was the other night. A little touch was absolutely delicious. Um, yeah, class. So really, really good. Um, do we make the final? Do we beat the Swedes? Yeah. You said that like, yeah, like as what <laughs> what even question are you asking me? Swedes are a good team though, girls. Like they're good. They're a good team. They are, but I do think we've got the nicer side of the draw right now. I think I'd rather play Sweden than I would France or Germany at this mm-hmm. point. Yeah. Um, and then you get to Wembley in a final against those two and anything can happen. I just yeah. think the home advantage and how the country has actually really got behind the team, the crowds that they've got, the support that they're receiving. It just all feels right. I said from the beginning, I think they can do it. And I stand by it. I still think they can do it. Yeah. All right. So score. Freya, score on Tuesday against the Swedes. I'm going 2-0 England. 2-0 I'm England. Gem? I'm going 3-1. 3-1. England. And then we get to the final. Who do we want to play? Is it is it France or Germany? I probably tend to avoid France, I think, the way they've been playing. I'd go Germany, but that's just me. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not. They're completely different, I think, in France's speed and attack is frightening. Like, they are so quick going forward. And I think they pose different threats, whereas Germany, I think, are just harder to break down. I think they'll be harder to get through and they'll hit us on the counter. So I think it's two completely different games. (laughs) Right now, watching France, I think I'd say I'd rather play Germany. But... (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. You I, you don't agree, Freya, or do you no, agree? Gemma's facial expressions gives it away every time she speaks. <laughs> she's I'm so, torn. She's so animated. No, um, no, I'm gonna say I literally I couldn't pick. They're very two very different sides. Um, I think with my experience at the Euros, I wouldn't want to play Germany, but <laughs> you know it's it's different in it. So, um, no, I'm not sure. Maybe probably France. Do we set up differently then, depending on who we play, or do we go with the same? Same mentality, same front foot. What what change? What changes? I think that Serena should she'll stick to her game plan, and people will change for us. Of course, there'll be little tactical adaptations to it, but I think something that people have said about her is you know your role, you know what you're doing. She's very organised. She drills in exactly her style of play, yeah. and it leaves no questions or no answers left unturned. And I think that will be something that she'll take into the last two games. You know, it's gotten this far. I don't think she'll change again. Um, I think the starting lineup will be similar, if not the same, like she's done the whole time, kept it very consistent. Um, but I think where she really stands above others is her decisions and the timing she makes her decisions. I think her substitutions have been brilliant. The timing she's made has been brilliant. And I think that won us the game against Spain the other night, ultimately. Yeah. I think the battle of the managers, and I think Serena won that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It was yeah, decision making. The, the the on-field management was world class, and uh, ultimately that's what led to the victory. Yeah. Um, does is Hannah feeling better now, Freya? Is Hannah better? Is she going to start between the sticks or what? Yeah, well, I think she. I saw a tweet actually earlier. I think she's back in the squad now, but no, she she's a different class keeper. Does she? Is, she yeah. I've always said it because obviously I played with her at Blues when I was at Blues about 
three, four years ago, distribution's a joke. Like, she's got some different distribution reaction times and real. So I think she's just, yeah. if she doesn't start this tournament, next tournament's 100% her. Definitely, definitely. She's shown herself to be to be one of the top keepers in the game, and she, to be fair. Over yeah. the last kind of 18 months, two years, she's really come through the really come through the ranks and Villa are very lucky to have her, to be fair. Um, yeah, quality keeper. Cool. All right. So um there's there's our views on the Euros. Um let's let's keep our fingers crossed and let's tune in, support the girls and give them all the support and the drive that they'll need to to bring back the it's coming home. Did we say that? Did we say that for the yeah, we do, don't we? It's coming home. We do say that. We'll say that. I'll, I'll be singing that anyway, even if I'm on my own. Um, so what have I got down here? Last one. Oh, yeah. So uh just to finish, um I have very, very luckily from both Freya and Gemma two match signed shirts to put up a charity after this podcast goes live. So I will be doing some promotions on social media about how you can get involved with that. And to grab um, either of those shirts or both, if you're lucky, both signed from the girls, um, stick up on your wall, wear around the games, whatever you want to do. But thank you very much for both of you for getting involved with that. That's class. Um, and we will um, advertise and announce the charity that that money will go to after this podcast. Um, girls, it's been tremendous having you on. I wish we didn't have to finish, but I can only do 45 minutes. So um, it's been amazing having you both on. I really appreciate your views, your opinions um and your discussion around what is to me a very important subject and i know you're both very promotive and um and, and supportive of the subject too so i really i really appreciate your time um i wish you all the very best with the remainder of pre-season and um first game is when when's the first game Ninth september Ninth september oh, so you've got a little bit longer a little bit longer than the men's game to start okay cool so are you going on tour is there tours planned are you going abroad or are you staying in the uk um, We've got air trips planned, I think. Cool, cool. Yeah, I think we're off to Spain in a couple of weeks. Oh, very swanky, very swanky, very nice. Well, listen, both of you have an amazing pre-season um, and I can't wait to watch you both when the season starts again. Um, massive thank you for being on today and I'll speak to you both soon, all right? Cool, Bye. thank you for having us on. All right. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye.